that would we all stick to the end of the novel. So I asked our three panelists if they just want to speak a little bit about the issue of connection with our reader or our student uh, and transparency versus other goals in the, the works that we're discussing. So, Mackenzie or Catherine or Kate, would you like to start? <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll say, I'll admit that when I first saw the abstracts from, from Mackenzie and Catherine, I sort of gulped. <laughs> <laughs> But then after I, after I read them, and then especially after I got to, to hear your papers, it really struck me that um, in all three of these contexts, uh, we're, we're all interested in how creators and recipients of, of whether it's a sort of cultural product, like a book, or a well, I think that education is a cultural artifact too, right? Um, so this relationship, um, this sort of tension between the, the person giving this cultural artifact and the people receiving it, um, maybe with a, a very different perspective as, as Mackenzie was, Mackenzie, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> as Mackenzie was discussing. Or maybe you talked about the difference between the critical reception and the, uh, and the the commercial success of the Brett East Malice book. Um, so <coughs> this tension between the creators and the recipients, it just repeats itself um, in, in every context. And that could be a, an opportunity for us to address our audience, whatever audience that, that happens to be, whether it's international students or people reading popular literature. Um, to address that audience in a way that can can be more easily understood by them. Yeah, I think I think there's a, a sort of tension that exists between well, I guess in the, the world I come from, which is children's and young adult literature, there's this idea of um, books belong to their readers, sort of, and so you have as authors and publishers and um, whoever is creating this literature can do whatever they want. We can do it with whatever intention we want. But as soon as at some point you have to let it go and you have to hand it off to the people that you are creating it for. And I think education is the same way where you can do whatever you want behind the scenes and but as soon as at some point you have to hand this off to someone else and someone else has to receive it, only half your job is in the creation of it and then that other part is giving it to someone else and someone else needs to receive it in order for it to be totally complete. Yeah, but on the other hand, I in all of ours I see a very strong like author intention, whether it be how we're gonna design our education to help these international students who don't necessarily speak English for or um, authors who are very selfishly say, like, stop playing with technology and read my book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you're reading it on a Kindle, that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what you're reading it. Any questions? Hi. Uh, my question is for Mackenzie. And um, I Please also your... introduce yourself. Sure. My name is Paul Caserta. I'm uh, just about to graduate from the archives program here in Gisless, and I'm an archivist at the Digital Arc and a writer for myself for children's literature in YA. And I was curious uh, about your talk in many aspects, but at the very end, um, the ideas based on some of the books that you picked, such as The Hunger Games where the idea of looking at what authors and publishers, editors are doing with keeping technology in books of this um, very consistent, constant uh, topic. Um, you know, usually if it's not that, it's vampires or werewolves as of recent years. But I was curious to see what you thought. Could you not say at the same time that this whole idea of technology uh, too much technology in all of these stories that we read is really what the market looks for uh, in the sense that it is familiar to students because they've grown up in a technological world so they find it actually more interesting to read versus uh, the books we are forced to read in school such as uh, The Scarlet Letter, The Crucible. Um, and my second question I know there's more. Is, <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I'm trying to keep track of everything you That's asked. Okay. So I have to remind. Um, so I, I was Maybe just could, that. could she try to answer that? Sure, if you'd like to. Dark. Come back to before we that. go on to um, another question. So the first thing I would say is you said these books were forced to read in school. Um, two of the books that I, of the first books I think of of reading in school are Frankenstein and 1984, which both kind of prey on this very, like, this come from the same sort of spot of being very anxious about what is happening to our world. Um, and we've definitely seen, especially in young adult literature, I've seen this like rash of dystopians recently, primarily as a reaction to the fact that Hunger Games was so widely successful, and so immediately everyone wants to do something like that, because that's what we like, and so we have, I'm a bookseller, and we have all these kids who come in and say, I liked Hunger Games, so I want something like that. They don't want to read other young adult books, they want to read something like Hunger Games. Um, and I think it also goes along with the idea that like, as a child, children read up, so you want to read something that, like, if you're 12, you want to read about a 14-year-old hero. If you're 14, you want to read a 16-year-old hero. And I think it's the same with te technology in books or with setting, that if we're living in this world with um, iPhones and iPads and things like that, we want to read about a world that has this slightly elevated aspect to it. We don't necessarily want to read about our world, but we want to read about something with sort of familiar ties to it, um, but enough of a, a fantasy element to create a sense of wonder. Um, I guess, so, like I focus specifically on speculative fiction in my paper, so of course that's, we take these things in speculative fiction, works because you take things that are familiar and then exaggerate them to sort of make a point. Um, I've lost track of what your question was. Did that kind no, of answer it? it? It's okay. Um, <laughs> I just find it interesting, your perceptions, because uh, even other YA authors, such as Mark Peter Hughes, who wrote Lemonade Mouth originally, and I in the Wallpaper, recently came out with another book where uh, the story is about a civilization who lives in the city of Providence, Rhode Island, which is now a dome a giant dome and everything outside of the dome is not in existence anymore. Um, you can almost say that post-apocalyptic tales have actually been increasing in YA in the past years. Uh, my second question, you didn't answer my first question, by the way. That's OK. <laughs> um, my second question was, could you technically say that, again, using Hunger Games as an example, where you have a sector 12, who is the slums, and they use coal and they work in the mines. And then you have a major city who is all technologically advanced and they spend money on anything they can see fit, uh, whether it's foolish or not, that really it is the same type of story as many other books in the past, uh, but just a new age of storytelling. So in a sense, in this case, we are looking at a futuristic setting of, uh, in a sense, poor people rising up against the higher ups, but is it any different when you look at older examples going back to even medieval literature of serfs rising up against lords? So frankly, I think every story that is being told now has already been told. We're just finding new ways to tell them. Um, and I did history for my undergrad, and I agree with you completely that almost every major plot you see in any novel can be found somewhere in history. Like everything has really happened, and everything. I don't know, I think we are telling the same stories to some extent, so what starts to matter is how you're telling them and what sort of threads you have in your stories that people really grab onto. So clearly there's something in Hunger Games that people have really, really grabbed onto, and I think it is that idea of a society that, it's the same kind of idea with 1984, that it's a society that's just familiar enough that we feel comfortable there, but it's different enough that we're a little bit afraid of the fact that we feel kind of comfortable there because it looks like something that our world could turn into. Other questions? Uh, since there are a couple of people we have a question for um, Catherine or Kate first. Yes? So I have a question for Kate about um, teaching international students. And I'm wondering how uh, you approach And you are? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Kate Newman. Um, I'm in the MLIS program at Simmons. I'm graduating in August. And I'm um, currently working at Primary College where I do um, instruction. And I'm looking to a career in information literacy and instruction. And I'm wondering about the approach to international students who come from countries like China where the notion of plagiarism and attributing work is very different. And how do you approach um, communicating the importance of citing your work without insulting the culture that they come from where that is not a problem? I think that this is a this is actually a bad habit in people who talk about, not like you, me, what I, what I would say is a bad habit in people who talk about information literacy, of going straight to the as an example. And we all do it because, you know, that for anyone who is a librarian or for anyone who is a professor or a teacher, 
that, you know, it gets you right in there and you go, oh my god, again, I can't believe it. I just explained this in class last week. But if you explained it, and if I explained it in class last week and they're doing it again, that means I didn't explain it well enough. So I think that there, there's two approaches I take here. And one is to situate the discussion about plagiarism and also related ideas about um, paraphrasing and, and summarizing to situate that not just in a, you're from China, so you don't know how to do this and let me teach you how, um, which might work in the short term, uh, but instead to try and integrate it with some of the other, the more broader understanding of information literacy, which is not just about correctly reporting information, uh, but about this sort of very, very big picture critical thinking set of abilities about refining a research question um, and often students from students from cultures which have trouble adapting to American standards on plagiarism may also have trouble adapting to the, the American style of, uh, uh, you know, the research topic is not assigned by your professor, but is chosen largely by the student. And trouble with the earlier stages can kind of slip under the radar. The librarian doesn't notice it, the writing center tutor doesn't notice it, um, it's only when the paper gets handed in that someone notices there's some plagiarism going on. So that's the most obvious aspect of, um, of sort of this cultural misunderstanding, but it's not the only one. Uh, now, the other more, more practical way, for since you probably can't just wake up tomorrow and say, I'm going to start a gigantic information literacy program that encompasses all the zero standards, um, if you ask students to make explicit whatever mental model they are using to understand what is, um, and not even what is plagiarism, but what is a good way of, of citing sources, or what is a good way of acknowledging the work of other scholars before you, um, if you get them to articulate exactly what they currently think they should do, and then you can explain differences, not criticisms of what they're doing, but differences between the style that was acceptable in their first institution and the style that is acceptable here. Um, and if you, it's, it can be hard to, to tone down the value judgments, but the more you can do that, the better. To focus on making explicit what the differences are as opposed to saying this is the, the better way. Uh, do we have any questions first for Catherine? Uh, no, that's right. Uh, I'm going to ask one, and then uh, I'm a second semester business student concentrating on records management and uh, technology. And I wanted to ask uh, Catherine if you feel that Ellis achieves his goal in lulling his reader into boredom and uh, making his reader reach apathy. And as a former non-reader, I would ask, in this case, if he does, what makes the reader finish the book? Um, so it's a little harder to answer with Lesson Zero because there hasn't been as much reader response like talk about it. They are apathetic and bored. <laughs> <laughs> for example, when American Psycho came out, it was like a huge thing about how like unpleasant it was to read. And there were a lot of very famous like, writers, critics, like well-known readers who just said, no, I did not finish this book, or this was the most book, like boring book I've ever forced myself to get through. So they waxed eloquent about their apathy. Yeah, so there are a number of people who don't finish Brighty Smells. There are a number of people who either put it down because they think that what's happening in it is completely objectionable and no one should ever read, like, write this or read this. There are some people who put it down because his sections of description or his repetition get to them and they say, this is boring, I don't care. So. Um, I kind of liken it to um, the art movement in which they paint canvases a single color uniformly. There are a lot of viewers who go to that and they don't get it and so they just say, this is dumb, um, and move on. And there are a lot of people who react that way to Brady Spells' books because they don't want to look into what he's trying to do. They are reading to have a good read and this is not a good read. It, like that it's not enjoyable necessarily. <laughs> not that it's not well done. Well, thank you for seeing beyond that and pointing out to us that this is intentional and that it's sort of purpose of the goal. Yes? Actually, I have a question that kind of, well, it's not really a question, a thought that goes, that goes off of this. Um, 
I don't know if you can. You are? My, my name is Stacy. I'll be presenting later. Um, I'm a first year graduate student in the children's literature and library science school degree. Um, but I have an interest in um, trauma themes in literature. <laughs> I feel like that's what you're talking about. Um, just a little. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if the repetition that you see um, coming up in these books, as much as it um, has a reader response effect, I'm wondering if it's sort of representative of like the trauma experience where repetition is used as a coping mechanism to um, either deal with a horrific event or sort of retrieve your narrative after you like lost a bit of it from um, amnesia or repression or things like that. Um, and also having that secondary reader response effect where as much as you as a reader are bored, you also have this witness obligation because you are listening to someone um, sort of talk their way through the problem. So I have done a little bit of research into this field because I like to write about um, books like Extremely Loud and Kindly Close where it is a healing narrative. But I wouldn't say that this is a healing narrative because um, nor American Psycho or really any of Brett Easton Ellison's books I think maybe he's using the same idea in a way to damage, because if you get a lot of information quickly um, and you get it in kind of a like a fast-paced way with a lot of it very quickly um, and kind of lacking the kind of the narrative we look for, then it can be traumatic. And I think in a way, some of these novels can have moments for the reader that are almost traumatic. And so it's more of the narrator and the reader together being traumatized by what is happening or repeating it because they can't get out of mind, but not healing from it. So using the same logic, but using it in the opposite way, the way that uh, therapists have harnessed what's already happening in trauma victims and used it in a structure to make them better, Ellis is using to wreck that. And, Creative effect in both his, his narrators and his readers. So sort of putting putting the reader through the, the first rate of trauma. Yeah. And having to deal with it later. Other questions? Yes. Uh, my name is Tim. I'm a Gissel's master's student. Um, primarily interested in archives and um, sort of harmful digital environments. Um, but just personally very interested in literature. And this question is um, primarily intended for Mackenzie. I wonder, thinking about that divide between digital immigrants and digital natives, um, if you think that older authors, even if they intentionally sort of avoid this nostalgic tendency that you're talking about to um, glorify the old and kind of cast the new, um, especially technologies as sort of um, maybe not evil but damaging in some way, um, if even if they make a conscious effort to avoid that tendency. If they can depict modern technologies that digital natives live in in a way that doesn't seem forced. Um, like I'm kind of thinking of, this is not children's literature, but you know, when someone like Jonathan Branson starts writing text messages into his narrative, it just seems so, so wrong. And it really kind of causes a break. Like you, it completely destroys the suspension of disbelief. Um, because you get that he is just from a different generation and doesn't understand how this works. And so it just kind of doesn't work. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you think that people who were not raised with this technology can write about the experience of using it from the perspective of someone who was raised with all this around. Um, you know, can a 40-year-old write for 14-year-olds and make it something that they can actually relate to? That's the whole big question of children's liter literature is can 40-year-olds write for 14-year-olds and like have people respond to it? <clears throat> well, um, who would write if it wasn't somebody that was, you know, old enough to grasp some of these concepts? Yeah, well, that's, that's the thing is, all children's literature children. is reflective in that sense, and that it's written by people who are looking back at being children rather than experiencing it well, in I the mean, moment. That's always always been the case. All in children's literature is, and um, and uh, just to you know, kind of want to make note that the, the generation that created the digital environment is that that age. You know, so not all of those people are completely digital immigrants. 
um, in that sense. It's just the timing, just like, you know, there was a certain group of people that grow, grew up without cars in their everyday life, but they adjusted, and the people that didn't have cars every day in their life created vehicles and cars for the rest of the future generations. So they're not completely unaware of the experience of interacting with that technology. I think that's true. Therese, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Therese Moylan. I'm also in the business program. Okay. I think that's true. I think that the idea of an immigrant and a native exists throughout time. Like, that's not something that's new to our generation. But I think there's always a divide between people who are born with this into their life, who are born into this world with nothing else they know but this, and the people who this comes in halfway through and you kind of have to adjust your life to adapt to. I don't know if it means that you can never, like, there's definitely people who adapt really well to change and have integrated, and people who have integrated this technology into their lives and um, made it work for them. Um, and then there's people who don't do it so well. And so I think it depends on the author, really, in answer to your question. Um, I have the same thing where I feel like a lot of books that I'll read, um, authors who are trying to replicate uh, texts or emails or anything, and as soon as you try and do it, it comes off so inauthentic. And I don't know if that's necessarily a, a an idea of like digital immigrants versus digital natives, or it's just the idea that we that's not we can't replicate how we naturally speak um, or how we naturally communicate. I'm not sure. I think it exists. The disconnect exists in writing like dialogue of teenagers speaking. In some books, you you can't. Some authors just aren't adept at reading that. You can read it, and it just can't. Just doesn't resonate. True. And then I think there's other authors who. I'm not sure how, but sort of avoid that problem, and maybe it's because it's a, a literal, tra I feel like too, hmm, how do I say this? I think sometimes when you read like text speaking books or like trying to replicate text, the author takes all these stereotypes and puts them into the text, and it's the same thing when you're trying to replicate how teenagers talk, because we're like, so we know teenagers like to talk about this, and they like to say this, and they use this kind of abbreviation, so we're gonna put them all in this one line. Um, whereas it does not really like how anyone speaks is when we take everything we know about one type of conversation and throw it into something. Um, but I also think in answer to your question, there's sort of like, everyone when you write to some extent is imagining the, the situation or is imagining themselves as a different person and how other people react in imagined circumstances. And so that being said, I think the digital, digital immigrants, to use that term, can write about digital natives effectively if they can um, sort of bridge the gap that we, we use whenever we create fiction for people, whether you're writing about uh, other cultures or other times in history or just other people who are experiencing different things than you. you have to to some extent, use your imagination to figure out how people would authentically react in this imagined circumstance. Um, so I do think it is possible, it just doesn't work 100% of the time. Like I, I have a question for you, I'm sorry. You're going to have to talk some more. <laughs> um, uh, you, I mean, you, you've been talking about uh, the, the problem of this gap um, and the, this perpetuating message of older authors are telling younger children um, technology is bad, or rather that it's it's worse than if you just go outside and play and the traditional like do you know, go out and live in the world instead of just being in front of your TV. Um, but I'm wondering if maybe it's also uh, not just that message, but also a, a message that's a little more like worldview. Because you talk you talk about um, you talk about digital natives and digital immigrants, um, and in, I'm thinking in particular for the Hunger Games where um, that the, the difference between them is the technology becomes bad. Um, the digital natives of the capital become a problem because um, the technology is centered around a group who wants to use it for their own personal gain and power um, and, and oppressing others. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe that's not supposed to jolt, especially with the Hunger Games, which is supposed to happen with America, if that's not supposed to be a jolt for younger readers to become aware that um, you don't have to wait for the apocalypse to happen for this to be a situation because right now, like, yes, you live in America and you were born with a cell phone in your hand, um, but just you know, an ocean or so away, you've got countries where they've never heard of a cell phone, um, never heard of clean water, and things like that. Um, so I'm wondering if maybe it's not so, not necessarily just um, uh, you know, stop, get off your computer, and go do something useful like read a book, um, but also let's look outside of this box that you that you happen to be in um, and understand that not everybody has all of this technology, and to people who don't have it, you look kind of bad. <laughs> Yeah. I, I just want to say, really I don't I was gonna say that in response to that other than I think you're, you're definitely correct with that in the sense that we like to pretend like these worlds are so far away from us, but we are living in Pan Am, like this was, we are the capital, guys. <laughs> um, this, is, this is our world that we live in. So yeah, it's, it's, 
a message not just for like in the future this could happen, it's a message for this is happening in the mm -hmm. present moment, I think, which and, is why. Yeah, and just the idea of like the, the, the gap here is not just that like adults, the adults have no idea what it's like <laughs> teenager, but also that teenagers are also unaware of a great deal that's going on around them, and it's just sort of like that message across the gap, like, hey, you're the capital, <laughs> sorry. So, um, I don't want to give you too hard a task, Kate, but I'm going to ask you a question with just a few minutes to answer. Uh, your students, they sound, they come, they come to you because they want to improve their English, but they come from a variety of disciplines, and they're in Boston, so they're, they tend to be already, they're in school, they're in graduate school. Are some of them students of literature, of literature and English, American literature? Do they encounter such books? Do they? How do they parse these? I don't think I've heard of any student reading Bret Easton Ellis. <laughs> 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 Although I know that some of them have watched the movie of American Psycho. Um, that, that's actually, a, I hope that someone who studies children's literature will take this topic and run with it. Um, because it's really easy as a, this is me taking off my librarian hat and putting on my teacher hat now. It's really easy to find recommendations and ways to, to search through, through books by grade level or by lexile, but it's hard to find, you know, research advisory for books with, you know, rel with lower grade levels or with, with lower lexile ranges that are intended for or maybe suitable for adults. And you know, that this young adult genre, it's 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 very popular, not just with you know the, the 14 to 16 age range, but you know, with, with people in their twenties and their in their thirties and maybe older. I, I shouldn't be pontificating about this, but so many children's love people in the world. <clears throat> so I think that it could be a, a really great contribution. Um, to start to, to to figure out and then tell me um, if there's some sources of recommendations for uh, young adult books that appeal to adults. So how about it, guys? So I don't know. on that note, since it's 11:59, I have to say that Kate's email address is <laughs> nyhan at Simmons.edu, but we're all interested in the answer. And would you like to wrap up, or shall I? Go for it. So I think it's pretty clear cut that uh, lunch is being served from 12 to 1.30. There are two more sessions this afternoon at 1.30 and 3.15. There are 90 minutes like this session. There are more speakers in the afternoon. These were organized by topic. There are breaks and food is being served throughout the day because we all know grad students are always looking for free meal. <laughs> but uh, there's also free ideas being offered this afternoon. So please have some lunch and come back for all the rest.